Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Chuck. I want to welcome you to worship with us today at Grace Presbyterian Church in Partyville, Wisconsin. This uh, today is our ninth coronavirus online Sunday message. And I'm just amazed when I look back, I counted, and this is our ninth day in isolation. And uh, wow, a lot of time has gone by. It looks like there's still a little bit more ahead of us. But there are some things here that we have to be thankful for. We certainly can be thankful that this coronavirus, at least in our area in Columbia County, has not been multiplying as it has been in other places. We're not seeing the kind of death toll that others have seen in other places. And we're very thankful for that not coming to us. We're thankful that we can uh, have this online opportunity to be able to worship together, at least in this way. And for other ways that God has given us that we can pick up the phone or text or care for each other in a lot of different ways. And I just want to encourage you to be um, looking for ways that you can reach out. I think it's a mistake that we could easily fall into to consider this isolation that we're in, so to speak, as an excuse for ignoring the people that God has placed us around. So there might be some restrictions, yes, but there are a lot of ways. I want to encourage you to be praying and uh, maybe making a meal um, and doing whatever you can to bless and minister to those around you. But anyway, we're very thankful for various things that the Lord has done for us. We're thankful that we can get out. We thank you that there's, we thank God that there's plenty of food to eat. We thank God that there is uh, access to excellent health care that other places that's been put in great jeopardy. And so we have much to be thankful for. When we say we're thankful, what we're really doing is we're giving glory to God. We're saying this isn't because we worked so hard and, and done everything right. In fact, we know we haven't done a lot of things right. <laughs> but uh, we're thankful to God. We're thankful to God. Our lives are in his hands. And one of the necessities of every day of the Christian life, and particularly in this coronavirus season, uh, it's a necessity that we simply find time to look to God and trust Him and rest our lives in His hands. As we've said before, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days, these days included, all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a great promise. We're in God's hands. You're in God's hands. We can trust him. We need to trust him. That needs to be the meta-narrative, really, of our whole lives. I trust you, Lord. I'm in your hands. So um, I want to remind you of a few things. I want to remind you to uh, check out our Friday morning email update. If you don't get that already, um, call Mary. Call the church office and leave a message to be put onto that email chain. You'll find in there reminders to pray and other kinds of announcements. Uh, want to encourage you to pray particularly for the Waxland family this week as they travel from Arizona back up to Wisconsin because of Steve's bike accident. That's going to be a rough trip for Steve and probably for um, for Kathy too in some ways. And so be praying for them. Also, there's a note in there about giving, and we want to just say thank you, Lord, and thank you for giving to Grace Church during this time. Yes, March was a pretty low month in some ways, and then um, that all came back. Uh, Budget-wise, I'm speaking of, it all came back in April, and so we had enough um, funds come in to actually pay all of our bills in the month of April, and that included a lot of quarterly bills that come in only once a quarter, so we're thankful. Um, for God's provision for us in that. There's some notes, other notes that are in that Friday update. We just want to remind you to look there. What do we have in store for us here this morning? Well, after we leave here, we're going to go to the Muscanero House, and they're going to lead us in singing, as they have before. And then we'll be back here for the third message in our God of Creation series. And so grab a Bible if you don't have one already, and bring that so you'll have a way to follow along. And then um, after that, we want to encourage you to find the link to the kids' sermon, particularly this week, because there will be some hello moms, or th happy Mother's Day moms, that will come in on that kids' sermon. And uh, you might want to look for those. Maybe there's even one for you. There's certainly not one for everybody, but we're looking forward to seeing those. It's always appropriate to say, thank you, Mom, and here we are on Mother's Day. So I just want to say to my mom, if you're watching, happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. And to all the moms, 
I just want to say thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your sacrificial love. The ways that you have served us and cared for us and loved us, our lives would not be the same without you. In fact, we wouldn't even have lives if you hadn't brought us into the world. And so we want to thank you, moms particularly, on this day. Well, let's see. Our call to worship is going to come from Isaiah chapter 49. I want to read that. And then after that, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And for leading in prayer today, I'm just going to actually turn to some of the Psalms, Psalms 51 through 56, roughly, and just kind of read some of the phrases there to lead us in our prayer today. So if you'd like to find those um, citations that I'm making, you can find them all in Psalm 51 through 56. Let's come to God, our call to worship from Isaiah 49. Can a woman forget the nursing child that she should have no compassion for the son of her womb? Even though these may forget, I will not forget you, declares the Lord. See, or behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you, first of all, for your faithfulness. for your loving kindness, for your care, that you never leave us nor forsake us, that you are with us always to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Lord. We come to you in confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. We're reading these from the Psalms. Every time it says me, let's think of that corporate me as we pray. Lord, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me, cleanse us from our sin. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Lord, hide your face from our sins and blot out all of our iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good. Thank you, Lord, for our salvation through Jesus Christ, not cleansed by hyssop, not cleansed by the blood of lambs or bulls, but by the blood of Christ. Thank you for that complete cleansing. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. Thank you, Lord, that our lives are in your hands. Give ear to my prayer, O God. Attend me and answer me. Evening and morning at noon, I utter my complaint and moan and you hear my voice. God will give ear, he who is enthroned from of old will give ear. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Lord, we just cast our burdens on you. Sustain us according to your word. Lord, you have kept count of my tossings and put my tears in your bottle. 
Are they not all recorded in your book? This I know that God is for me. Thank you, Lord, for your covenant faithfulness. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God, I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? Father in heaven, we ask that you would help us, that you would strengthen us, that you would take care of us, that you would take all of our sins away from us and wash them away. You would take all of the other burdens and concerns, our moanings and our askings. Hear every prayer. We thank you that you do. And we ask that you would meet our needs. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us and protect us of these corona vices, of fear that is greater than our joy in you, isolation that's used as an excuse for ignoring or wanting normalcy more than wanting you. Oh, Lord, free us from the bondage of our longings, of our bondage, really, to sin. We pray that you would make us good, that you would make us clean, that you would make us gracious, that you would make us joyful and beautiful and Christ-like, in fact saints of God. And we pray that you would use us, Lord. Use our words. Use our thoughts. Use our hearts, compassions. Use our minds. Use our witness. Use the hope that we have to be a credit and a glory to you, both within our families, within our homes, to those who are nearest to us and to the world. We ask this in the name and in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Please join us in singing, He is Exalted. Well, welcome back. As I lead us now in scripture, I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles 
to our couple of texts, first to Romans chapter 8, and we'll begin in verse 18, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, and then we'll turn over to Colossians chapter 1 from there. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we await the adoption of sons for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And then turning over to Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Here the title over this scripture aptly put the preeminence of Christ, the preeminence of Christ over his creation, over redemption, and over his bringing all things together in redemption. He is, speaking of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, that is through Christ, and in him. He is, Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he, Christ, might have preeminence. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. For once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, doing evil deeds, but now he has reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and which I, Paul, became a minister. Father in heaven, as we look to your word again, we ask that you would speak to us and speak to us by your spirit through the preaching of your word to deliver your truth specifically and helpfully and tenderly to us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're beginning again here in our creation series. This is the third in the series, and I believe it will be the last our series on God as the God of creation. And last week we looked at creation as a part of God's revelation, God actually revealing himself to us in his creation. But there are two things that we haven't acknowledged yet in this series. One of them is that this creation that we're living in, this current creation that we're living in is actually under a curse and in bondage and it's coming to an end. It's dying, everything in it is dying. And the second thing that we haven't recognized is that the real creation that we are going to enjoy as believers is the new creation, the Bible calls it the new heaven and the new earth, which will come and will never fade away. 
And so in this message, I want to just look at those two things, the uh, bondage that this creation is under and the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth, and then the way that these two realities point us to the person of Christ who brings us from this world into the next. That's our agenda for today. Well, first of all, as we look at this creation under the uh, measure of a creation that is scarred, that is cursed, that is under bondage and really is terminal, it's coming to an end. Um, I want to take you back to the first chapters of Genesis. And we're here in Genesis chapters one and two, just as a reminder. And as we go back to these chapters, we remember um, that our God is the creator God. He is the creator and that when he created, everything was glorious, everything was good, everything was perfect, and it was very good, says the Lord. And so it is in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, the original creation, the Garden of Eden is, is notorious as a place of harmony, a place of peace. Everything was in sync. Nature was in sync with man, man in sync with nature, <laughs> and, and all that God has created in sync with him, moreover, that being the greatest part of the peace and harmony of the Garden of Eden, is that everything was in ut unity and union with God, our creator. And as such, there was peace, there was harmony, there was perfect intimacy in the Garden of Eden. It was a place that was completely sinless. It was a place that was completely shameless and guiltless. There were none of the kind of um, terrible things that we have in our day to day with gangs and rape and murder and lies and, and drugs and addiction and even impatience. You think, yeah, between Adam and Eve, there was not even a moment's hesitation or irritation between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. There was nothing that was broken. There was nothing that was strained by sin. Adam and Eve were unselfish. They were Godward. No one cried in the Garden of Eden. No one grieved in the Garden of Eden. And above all of those things, below all those things, there was no death. Nothing was dying and nothing died. It was a world of life, harmony and life. Now, I want you to hear a kind of a sub point here, because as we begin in the Garden of Eden, one of the things we need to recognize is that in the perfect world of Genesis 1 and 2, that that world is very different from the world that we live in today, the broken and fallen world that we live in. And so in Genesis chapter 3, actually, that theme is introduced to us. When Adam and Eve are given one command, you may eat from any of the trees of the garden, but do not eat from this particular tree, because in the day that you eat of it, in that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And of course, they ate of the fruit of that tree. And so sin entered the world. And there were cataclysmic consequences that came not only to Adam and Eve, but all the way down through today from that first sin. They did not actually physically die in that day. God said, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. But the kind of death that God was speaking of was not a physical death so much as it was a spiritual death, a spiritual death, a death to God, an estrangement from God took place immediately when they sinned. They began hiding from God, and they became estranged from each other also. They were hiding from each other. They looked at each other, and they realized, we're naked. We need to cover ourselves. And that kind of uh, distancing has continued ever since. That spiritual, immediate spiritual death. So that was a death toward God. It was kind of a death of the soul, you might say, so that the New Testament says we're dead in trespasses and sins. We're dead to God. And that death is, was a death to innocence. It was a death, you might say, of the soul or a death to the sixth and greatest sense. You know, the five senses. And yet this is a death to the sixth sense, the sense of God, a death of the soul. You might say a death to the simple, intuitive, spiritual unity and happy submission that in the garden Adam and Eve had with God. It was just part of their life. It was part of their understanding. They had that unity with God. I might just compare that loss to 
this illustration of a, of a kitten. Most people know what it's like to have baby kittens and to see the way that they snuggle up. They instinctively know that they need to come to mother, that mother is going to nurse them. Mother is going to clean them. Mother is going to keep them warm. And so they instinctually creep, even with their eyes closed, they creep toward mother. They know to come to mother. Well, let's just imagine though, that in that litter of kittens, that one of the kittens may be being played with and falls from a high place or something, but there's some damage that's done to it. Not on the outward and the physical, but there's some damage that's done uh, to that kitten, to where that instinct, that go to mother instinct was severed. Well, you can imagine how bad that would be. A a mother can only do so much in in gathering that kitten to itself. And if if this kitten doesn't have that homing instinct, go to mother, stay warm, stay fed, stay clean, go to mother. She's the source. If that's gone, it won't be long until that kitten's even physical life is gone. And what I'm saying here is that this is kind of akin to the spiritual death that Adam and Eve, and consequently the whole human race, entered into. When they sinned, they died immediately to God. That God sense was immediately cut. And later they would die physically. And death at that time entered into the entire created order. Now, this isn't just conjecture. This is spelled out clearly for us in Genesis chapter 3. You'll find it in verses 14 through 20, where there's this, I'd call it just a thumbnail sketch, really, of the cataclysmic consequences of their fall into sin. And so the consequences to Satan are found in verses 14 and 15. The consequences to Adam and Eve and the rest of creation are found in verses 16 through 19. And so we have here that the greatest blessings that people could experience will then from then on be salted with agonies. Women, your pains will be multiplied in childhood, in in childbearing, yeah, childhood too. (laughs) Um, But the most marvelous moment will also become the most fearful moment. That wasn't true in the Garden of Eden. That's true Now, the conflict and abuse that comes when two people enter into relationship, that's also prefigured here in verse 16, particularly in regard to marriage, but by extension to all relationships. In in verse 17, the earth itself is cursed by God so that there's an imbalance in the earth and thorns grow up and weeds take over, thistles predominate. And this also makes it difficult for mankind. God says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat. In other words, it's going to be toil from now on. Every tree isn't just there giving you fruit under perfect harmony. God just providing for everything. You're going to have to work and you're going to have to sweat for it. And then, of course, at the end of verse 9, that famous statement, for from the ground you came, or from dust you came, and to dust you will return, speaking of physical death. And that could rightly be put also as an epitaph, really, over every living thing that has ever lived. You will die. You will die. The mortality the corruption of everything. Everything, though you might not be dead yet, you are dying. We're all headed, every leaf, every plant, every animal, every human being headed for death, physical death. Now, we could fast forward then from Eden to our day. And what I want you to see here is that all of the uh, nutshell of consequences that were spelled out for us there in Genesis 3 are really all there and we're experiencing them today. They're just as evident, if not multiplied, to us today. And yet over these thousands of years of these consequences of the fall, we've become more or less accustomed to them. I mean, nobody wants to die, but we're all aware of death. It doesn't shock us anymore. We know that it's coming. And even though we live in a world that basically denies denies sin and denies the depravity of man, denies even that there is such a thing as sin and God. Even though we live in such a world, we do have a sense as a society that humanity is in some way to blame for many of the catastrophic problems that we face, particularly um, environmental 
abuses and corruption. We think sometimes, I think it's kind of a folk knowledge that we have that, and I'm not sure it's altogether correct, but the, the thought is that if you only you could get rid of man on the earth and give the earth a thousand years to recover, earth would be a great place to live. But what this tells us actually is that that's not really the case. It's not all the fault of humanity that things are messed up. There's a curse on this creation. This is a fallen world. It's not just man. We live in a broken and fallen world. There would still be tornadoes. There'd still be floods. There'd still be earthquakes. There would still be weeds and invasive species. That's talked about there in Genesis chapter three. There would still be diseases and germs. There'd still be electric storms and tsunamis and floods. And beyond all that, even if all of those things could be eliminated, which they won't, there would still be death. Everything is dying. Everything is dying. We do not live in a perfect world. And so all this is to say, let's not over-idealize the fallen creation that we live in. Much as we love it, let's not over-idealize the creation. It's fallen, and especially every living thing, including us, dies. And that brings us to point two. That was point one. This brings us to point two, which is that at the end of this world, when Christ comes, when Christ comes again, he will gather together all of the peoples of the earth of every age. He will gather together everyone and everyone will be judged. And the damned will go with the, with the devils and his, with the devil and his angels to, the, to hell and be destroyed forever. And the saved will be raised resplendent and actually brought into a new, a recreated new heaven and new earth, which is the new creation. And so the Bible gives us glimpses then, numerous glimpses, in fact, of what glory in heaven will be like, the new creation, the new heaven, and the new earth. And we're going to just look at some of those. And first, if you would turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, and I'll read this and then just make a few comments on it. Revelation chapter 21. The title over the heading here is The New Heaven and the New Earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Verse 4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain, nor any, nor, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, "Behold, I am making all things new." This is the new heaven and the new earth. Let me just point out a few things about it. First of all, it's not just a place; it's a presence. It's not just the place of heaven. It is the presence. The very first thing about the new heaven and the earth is the restored unity between God and man. Let me read that to you. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And so the thing that was severed, the thing that was broken in the fall is the first thing that's repaired in the new heaven and the new earth. Fellowship, unity, harmony of heart with God. Wow. Second thing that we see here in this passage is the repetition of the word and the concept of no more, no more, no more. And whether it's in Isaiah 65 or 66 or here in Revelation where the Bible talks about the new heaven and the new earth, that term is often used, no more. There are things that will be no more. No more tears. No more mourning. No more crying. No more pain anymore, it says. No pain anymore. 
And along with that, all the things that caused those pains, that caused those sorrows, all of that, all the sin, all of the past memories, all the past experiences, all of the baggage, all of that, no more, no more, no more. It's a new heaven, a new earth, a new start, refreshment, a restart, a recreation. And then also in verse four, it says, and death shall be no more. Death itself, no more. No more under that covering, that blanket, that, that, that trench coat of death, always over our heads. No, death, the veil is swallowed up in victory, Isaiah 25 says. Death itself, the cloud of death, the, pile of, the pyre of death will be taken up itself. And then verses four and five, for the old order of things or the former things have passed away. Behold, I am making all things new. And so following the judgment and the banishment of the devil and his angels and all of the damned, there will be a new creation, a God-made glorious creation where everything that was broken in the old world will be restored. The severed, um, the severed intimacy will be fully restored in the new heaven and the new earth. The broken harmony will be fully restored. The every living thing subject to the curtain of death, the, to death itself, that will be replaced by being delivered from death forever into everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? We're headed there. This is such good news. We're going to a new world, a new land. And we don't have to hang on to this world as if this really is all that there is. That is not true. Now, if you would, jump with me from Revelation 21 back to Romans 8. And I'm just going to take some high points here. We read this earlier. I'm going to take some high points from verses 19 through 22 about the new heaven and the new earth. And what we're seeing here is that in the new world order, that the creation itself will be renewed. It says, and I'll just take the highlights here, verse 19, for the whole creation, the whole creation, this creation that we're living in now, the whole creation waits with eager longing. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation, yes, this world, the whole creation has been groaning together as in the pains of childbirth until now. That's the world we live in. And then verse 21, for the creation itself will be set free, ah, from its bondage to corruption. When we read corruption, we think decay and degrading and death will be set free from death. And what this adds to the picture here of the new heaven and the new earth is that God isn't just saving souls of men. God isn't just saving and redeeming, drawing men to him and women to him where there will be harmony and intimacy with him forever. No, in fact, God is redeeming the whole creation. He's bringing us into a completely renewed whole creation where we will have fellowship with him forever. Now, there are reasons to believe, particularly from 1 Corinthians 15, that the new creation will not only be better than this world, but better than Eden. You read, that about, read about that in the end of 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not going to go there. But here's the big picture that we've looked at so far. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and everything was glorious. It was Eden. And then sin came, secondly. Sin came, and this creation came under a curse and came under bondage to corruption. And if that were the end of God's creation, then indeed Satan would be the victor. Satan could stand, place his, hand, place his foot on the earth, so to speak. He could claim victory. I have succeeded in dethroning God and destroying creation, which was made for his glory. And there'd be victory in that, but there's not. Because God's grand vision that we've seen here is that the end game for the universe is that God will restore and redeem not only the chosen whom he has 
saved of humanity up into heavenly glory, but he's saving the world itself. All of it will be for the harmonious praise of God's glory forever. And he shall reign forever and ever. Revelation eleven fifteen. Now, just building on this in closing, I want to just have a few summary things to, to add here. And the first is that the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, isn't made possible by God twirling his magic wand. The new heaven and the new earth and the redeeming of this earth and those who are in it is not made possible by the twirling of a magic wand, but it is made possible by the creator himself coming to earth and dying on the cross. Jesus Christ dying for us. That's the significance of what we read in Colossians chapter 1 together, which is described, which describes Christ in verse 15, the Redeemer. He is the image of the invisible God. Verse 16, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in them, visible and invisible. He is the sustainer, the one who holds all things together. And then verse 19 comes down to this climax. For in him that is in Christ, all the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross which is to say that Jesus Christ in his death, which should have been the penalty that we would pay for our sins, he pays for that so that those who repent and turn to him in faith can be forgiven and brought into the new creation, the new heaven and the earth, so that you will all be redeemed and all of creation will be redeemed and may in heart and soul, have joy and live forever in the new heaven and the new earth. So it wasn't by the twirl of a magic wand. It wasn't by a declaration of independence that anyone was able to go from this world into heavenly glory, the new heaven and the new earth, but it was by payment in blood, Christ's blood, the creator's blood, so God triumphs. He has victory over sin, victory over Satan, and he brings his own saints into glory. Wow. Moreover, you're invited. You're invited into this world of glory. You're invited. The invitation is simply this. Repent of your sin to God. Acknowledge it. Repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ, the payment for sin and the forgiver of sin, and you shall be saved. <laughs> wow, what an invitation. And it's not just an invitation, it's also the basis on which we enter into everlasting glory. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if not, excluded, excluded, unsaved. Where do you stand in relation to eternity? What have you made of the invitation that Christ has made? If you laid down your life to him in repentance and faith and said, take my life, I give it up to you. I give everything up to you. I want to be yours. I trust you. I want to encourage you to do that if you haven't done that. Also, we see here that the new heaven and the new earth is real. 
and that one day we will be there. I know this life seems long, even this coronavirus uh, hostage situation seems like a long time, doesn't it? But it won't be long until we are there forever and ever and ever in the new heaven and the new earth. And that's our hope. And we can cling lightly to the things of this world and not set all of our aspirations on our homes and our families here. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in glory. That will be the glorious place. Let's work for that glory. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, says the word of God. So we want to be in Christ. We want to lead people to Jesus Christ. And then lastly, I just uh, want to remind you, if you're a believer, you have been delivered from death. Jesus talks about this. He says, if anyone believes in me, he will never see death. And what I take that to mean is that though we die, that as we approach that moment of death, still in this life, still in this life, still in this life, that when we come to the moment of death, we pass right on through. We pass right on through. Today you will be with me in paradise, he says, to the thief on the cross. We pass right on through. You are no longer under the cloud of death. That's why at Christian funerals that I do, I always, at the graveside, I'll read those familiar words, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. That comes, at least it's an allusion to Genesis chapter three, which we looked at. From dust you have come and to dust you will return. But I always add to that, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And for those who are in Christ, dust. To glory, dust, to glory. That's our destiny. A new heaven, a new earth, the presence of God, unfiltered. What a blessing forever. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your encouragement to us today. Help us to hold lightly to the things of earth and not be so bent out of shape by the things that are happening around us. Help us to trust you. May the meta-narrative of our lives be, I trust in you. I trust in you. What can man do to me? And Father in heaven also, I ask that you would lead each of us day by day into your presence, that we would trust you more. Encourage us with these words, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'd like to invite you now to close in the singing together of the Lord's Prayer. Join with us in saying the Lord's Prayer together.